So this is a tutorial on cellular automata. I've tried recording this and I realize it's really hard to do. It's really hard to explain, even though it's a simple concept. So I'm gonna try to do better this time. And part of that involves me showing you what we're making right off the bat. So uh, you see, we have this empty, we can control it and it seems to move around this blob. Uh, what we're making is, you'll see it in a second, a sand simulation. Look at this. So it populates and very nicely. So I'm going to build a lot of sand over here and then kind of stop spawning it. It also kind of like settles in kind of like a physics-y way, uh, the way sand would. And the interesting thing about the sand simulation, which is already pretty cool, but uh, the interesting thing about the sand simulation is there's actually no physics involved which seems strange. How does it know where to go? How is it falling? Clearly there's gravity. Uh, there is no physics here. And it's because uh, I'm going to make the sand simulation and teach you how to make it uh, using something called cellular automata. What does that mean? Basically what it means is we have a grid, a grid, if I can show you, a grid of pixels, okay? And each pixel can either be on this represents a pixel that's lit, like a light bulb it, it is on, or the pixel can be off. So it's either black or white. In my case, I made it kind of like yellowish for sand, but each pixel is black or white. And without knowing anything about what it's making, it's only going to look at the pixels near it. So here's a pixel. It can only access the one to the right, the left, up, down. Using only this information, you can make pretty complex behavior um, that looks like sand. So at no point does it have any velocity or acceleration. It's literally just pixels uh, turning on and off. That's what I'm going to show you how to do. And for those of you that know, uh, this is very reminiscent of Conway's Game of Life. You might have heard of that. Um, this is also something the Wolfram from like Stephen Wolfram from Wolfram Alpha seems to study. Um, it's this idea of getting really complex behavior, like a physics simulation, uh, using no information about physics. So emergent behavior out of nothing, okay? We pause the cellular automata tutorial to talk about the sponsor of this video, and that sponsor is FlexiSpot, who uh, makes a lot of things, but most prominently standing desks. If you haven't seen a standing desk before, it turns out that a lot of people, uh, me included sometimes, uh, like to stand when at a desk, because sitting uh, chronically for like eight hours a day, it's like the new smoking. It's it's bad for you. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Okay. Do you like it? Uh, yes. What version did you pick? I don't know. She picked the small one with this color. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I like that it um it comes with like customizable things like uh, this drawer that I ended up uh, deciding I didn't want. I like that I can have a little little thing. That is nice. Yeah. Uh, show the ports. Ports. If you had to pay for it. Work at one desk for the rest of my life. <laughs> they have a whole uh, array of different tables. I believe I have the E7 Pro where you can pick things like the uh, type of wood. I decided to go pretty simple. Uh, building was uh, super fast and I don't know what to say. Like it's a standing desk. It works beautifully. It's surprisingly smooth as you um, go up and down check out links and descriptions uh discounts on stores and um yeah let me with that preface if you're already confused then dear god leave now uh with that preface let me show you how to make this and again everything we're gonna make which is gonna be pretty complicated somewhere here on the frame of the uh, tutorial you're gonna see that this is available on patreon i would highly recommend it i only uh, submit stuff to patreon that i feel like is like a value. So Patreon, sand, tutorial. That's why I only make few but long tutorials because I wait for a good idea. And by the way, this whole idea of cellular automata and all that, yes, you can make sand. Yes, you can make game of life. But arguably, you can make anything. A water simulation, a mold, a moss, a fire simulation, all from just pixels, uh, which of course the benefit of is it runs very fast. Uh, but the hard part is figuring out how to make it work. So uh, you see I've added an object, a GeoNodes object, and I'm making it a grid. The reason I'm making it a grid is we are going to operate on a, um, on a X, Y uh, kind of grid here. <laughs> Great explanation. Uh, technically, you can do cellular automata in 3D or 4D or whatever, but 
we have a grid so that we have a pixel here, 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 and here. And uh, in this case, a pixel is represented by a face. What you are going to notice is if I change the resolution of this grid, which is why I'm adding an integer. So here you can see I'm changing it. Uh, it's going to stay a nice square grid because it's not like an elongated uh, rectangle. But what you're going to notice is if I make this three by three, um, it's strange because we only have four pixels. It's actually two by two. Why is that? Well, three by three refers to the points that are composing this grid. So I just want you to remember uh, if it's three by three or whatever, in your head, you have to subtract one since we're looking at faces. So uh, what I'm going to do, and this is going to be useful later, and we'll get to it, is I'm going to subtract by one. This is more so the XY resolution of our pixels, not our points. Okay. So with that out of the way, let me make a 20 by 20, which really is a 19 by 19 grid, and let's get started. So First concept is a pixel, like I said, can either be on, let's do a check mark. It can either be on or it can be off. On means it's white, you can see it. Off means it's black, you can't. And in this case, a on pixel is gonna represent, yes, there is sand there. So there's either sand or space, like empty void. So naturally, I'm gonna store a named attribute, make sure this is faces, everything here should be faces, no points, because we're talking about pixels. I'm gonna make a parameter called sand, an attribute called sand, which is gonna say whether or not uh, there is sand here. And uh, to make our lives a bit simpler, I know we're kinda deviating, but believe me, this is faster than the last recording. I'm going to make a material, so whatever I do here, it's gonna go through a uh, material, and for that material, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have it show straight up this uh, sand attribute we just made. So you can bring geo nodes information into the shader nodes. And now with that done, uh, you can see that the sand is either nowhere or everywhere. Okay, so I'm saying sand is equal to one. Every pixel has sand. Every pixel is alive or none of them. Okay. What I want to do is I want to start off by initializing this grid. So we only have one or maybe like a few uh, pixels of sand that I can drop around. Okay. So to do that, I'm actually going to start off with an empty. Uh, this empty is going to represent kind of like our cursor uh, where I want to drop sand. And uh, we should turn pixels on. They should be alive if they are near this empty. Okay. So to do that, of course, we want to set sand equal to one, but under what condition? It shouldn't be everywhere, but only where it is within some radius of the empty. Or you could find the nearest pixel, whatever you want. I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, so obviously what I want to do is I need to bring in information about this empty, mainly the location. I believe you can have this set to relative or original uh, because the empty is an object that we're moving with the origin set to itself. I'm going to set it to relative, but what I want to know is the distance between our empty, the location of the empty, and the position of our pixels. So again, I'm calculating the distance between the position of the pixels and the empty, and only if this distance or radius from the empty in some sense is less than a certain number, then I want to turn these pixels on. So immediately, all the pixels turn off because none of them are within a distance of zero, less than zero. But if I slowly increase this, you can see uh, we can move our empty and some of these are going to satisfy uh, that condition. I'm going to divide by two so less pixels are active. But of course, it could sometimes be two are on or only one is on. And that depends how close it is to each pixel. So here I'm kind of like in the middle. So as you might expect, uh, both pixels are going to be lit. Uh, you can find the nearest pixel, but I'm fine with m spawning uh, multiple sand blocks at the same time. Activate multiple pixels, okay? So what we've already done is I'm going to hit Control G. Uh, what we've already done is we have made a spawner that is procedural and spelled correctly um, to, and it updates to our empty. Okay, so that's actually our initial condition. I would recommend staying organized here. But, but 
Now what we want to do is we have our pixels, but they need to like move and update and whatever. And part of that is it's going to involve gravity in some sense. Pixels are going to move downwards. And the reason I'm saying this is uh, we should also, for our initial conditions, include a floor. Uh, so pixels can't fall all the way down. So before we start adding, you know, forces, quote unquote, uh, we are going to need to define the floor. So back in our spawner, or we could actually do it before the spawner. It's up to you. I'm going to do it outside of it so it's a bit cleaner. Uh, before our spawner, I also want to define a second attribute. Again, make sure this is faces. All of these should be faces. I want to make another attribute called floor. You can just as well make the floor kind of like sand. So you activate the floor. So these are all sand pixels. Uh, but for reasons that will become evident soon, I would just make its own uh, variable. So we're going to have the floor. I'm actually also going to make one for ceiling. And now the question is, how do I tell uh, certain pixels to be the floor? So floor is equal uh, to one. Floor is active. But where? How do we know where the bottom pixels are? Well, here is how we can uh, do that. So to basically isolate the pixels on the bottom, I need to know their index, which one applies. So if I go to my faces, you can see we have all this information, uh, like our floor, ceiling, and sand attributes. But they also have this enumeration, 36, 37, 38. And I need to know which of those numbers apply. Well. It's not as simple as you think, because if I use a delete geometry, and the reason I'm going to do this, again, set it to faces, is to show you how the indexing works. If I make a delete geometry um, that deletes if something is less than or equal to, so let's say the index is less than or equal to zero. So again, what is this saying? If the index is less than or equal to this number, then delete the face. Well. You can see it deleted this face, which is fine. But uh, what I want you to notice is as I increase this, probably better in solid view, as I increase this, the indexing goes up, but then, but then it goes to the next column. So this is actually a bit complicated. It, it would almost be easier if it went left and right, kind of, not really actually. But uh, the point is, this is how the indexing works which means uh, to define where the floor is, we're going to need a bit of a complicated function uh, because this doesn't kind of move nicely. I mean, it does, but could be nicer. Um, and particularly, how do we know if a pixel is down here? Well, uh, clearly index is equal to zero is here because it deletes. And then the question is, what is the next one uh, that is on the floor? So we know index zero and then, okay, it seems like index 19. So I'm going to go 0, 19. And then the question is, what is this one over here? Let's see. So I'm going to increase this. And then right there, uh, 38. And uh, those of you that see what's going on, you'll uh, note uh, that these are all multiples of 19. So 0 plus 19 is 19, plus 19 is 38. And I guarantee you the next one should be, I believe, 54. Let's see, wait, plus 19 is 48, plus 9 is 47, I believe. Let's see. So I'm going to go up to, or is it 57? Yeah, 57. Math is hard. Uh, you can see that these are multiples of 19. So in other words, we know a pixel is a floor pixel if it is a multiple of 19. Great. Uh, how do we isolate that now? So again, the whole point of this delete geometry uh, was to show you that. Um, how do we know if it's a multiple of 19? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that, but probably the easiest way, uh, you could divide and see if it's an integer. That means it multiplies nicely uh, into 19. Uh, what I would recommend is I would recommend adding a math node, and we want to see where the index, the index modulo, and you can use truncated modulo, floored modulo, modulo 19 is equal, and I'll explain this in a second, to zero. And forget this epsilon, it doesn't matter. So I'm taking the index, I'm taking something called modulo, and I'm seeing where it's equal to zero, and under that condition, make it the floor. Let's first of all uh, ensure that this actually works, and I'm going to do that by viewing this geometry. 
and then also viewing. That's a control shift, by the way, uh, to view a, a certain input. Uh, I'm going to view the floor attribute, and you can see all of a sudden it's populated. And if I bring this number up to one, two, three, uh, we can scan all the way up until we get to 18, okay? Because there's 19 and a column starts at zero. Um, in other words, this seems to be the expression that works, but why? Well, here's a simple analogy. I want you to imagine that you have a clock. So it's 12 up here, one, two, all the way around to 11, you have a clock. Well, if I told you it was 12 o'clock, or no, let me tell you. If I told you it was uh, 1 o'clock, whether it's 1 a.m., 1 p.m., uh, you, you know the clock is facing the 1, okay? But let's say instead I told you that it was 13 o'clock. Well, those of you that have seen something like this will know that this represents 1, again, but it's uh, specifically uh, 1 p.m. Now, how do you actually know that? Well, you're taking 13, you're subtracting 12, and you're saying there's one left over, okay? If I said it was 14 o'clock, you'd say it's 2 p.m., yada, yada. Now, in a hypothetical universe where this made sense, I could say it's 25 o'clock, and you would kind of know instinctually that this is still referring uh, to 1 o'clock in a very strange way. In other words, uh, anything that kind of like loops like this, like a clock where the numbers circle back on each other, is something called modulo. In this case, we don't have 12 numbers, but we have 19 numbers, special kind of clock, and we want to see where that remainder is equal to zero. So we're checking the same position every single time. Why is it the number 19? Well, remember, we have a 20 by 20 grid, and like we said, this is points, you subtract by one, and this is the grid of faces. That's why I mentioned it earlier. 20 minus one is 19. So more particularly, you're going to want to plug this in so we can change this dynamically. So if I make this 40, you can see it's still isolating the floor, even though the pixels get smaller and smaller. Okay. So that's the idea. Now, additionally, uh, we can use the same concept. They're making a nice rank out there. It's probably going to be loud. Additionally, we can make the same kind of concept, the same kind of idea to isolate the ceiling. I haven't explained why that's useful, but it will be. So what I am going to do, just going to move this off to the side, is I'm going to make another named attribute. So we have the floor. Oh, did I already make ceiling? Uh, we're going to have one called the ceiling, and it's going to be pretty similar. We're going to take the index. Well, I guess we already have this. Uh, we take the index. We take the floored modulo. It could be any kind of modulo of, uh, in this case, 19. But this time, remember, I don't care if it's equal to zero, but let's see, we have one, we have one, two. Remember, this is basically gonna go all the way up. Um, and then the question is, where is it the ceiling? It should be 18. And again, the reason for that is we have a, a grid of 20 by 20, which we know is really a grid of 19 by 19 pixels. Well. If this is equal to zero with the modulo and everything, well, when we go up, it's one, two, da, 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 da. If we have 19 uh, total, then it's going to be 18 because our first one is zero. So we kind of start at zero instead of one, which is why it's 18 instead of uh, 19. In other words, in other words, if we take this 19 number, which is the resolution of our grid, don't get confused by this 20 and I subtract one one more time, so in this case it's 18, and I plug that into our ceiling function, so our ceiling is active, it's true only on that selection. Well, if I now, and our floor is a zero, well, if I now view this and change our thing to ceiling, you would hope that it would work. Clearly it does not. Um, let's see what is going on here. So we wanna check where 19 minus one minus one should work, doesn't work, makes you think ceiling should be equal to one, there you go. Uh, you can see we've isolated where the ceiling is equal to one and where the floor are equal to zero. And you get the idea, we've isolated the floor, we've isolated the ceiling, okay? So now that we've done all that, we can proceed. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually gonna kind of clean up all this mess. So this is everything uh, we have for basically setting our floor and ceiling. So I'm gonna call that 
floor ceiling. Again, it'd be nice to kind of be organized here. So what we have so far is we set the resolution of our grid. Again, it's minus one for the faces. We generate the grid. Don't need this anymore. We define the floor and ceiling, and then we spawn in our movable initial condition. Well, now that's really all we need. The rest of it is just telling the grid how to update. That update should follow two rules. If you thought about my sand simulation, let me just show you. If you thought about my sand simulation, you're going to notice there's two things happening. The first one is the sand falls. So there should be some kind of gravity. Again, gravity doesn't exist because pixels are either on or off. The way I want you to think about this, by the way, is imagine you have like a board of like an LED board where they kind of show the stock prices or whatever. You see this text that says Amazon gone up 2% and it scrolls across the thing. It looks like the text is moving, but really light bulbs are just turning on and off. They don't understand the overall motion, which is why it's cellular tiny unit automata. They work automatically based on a certain rule. Um, so again, what I'm trying to tell you is the gravity thing doesn't exist, but it should have some kind of fake gravity. And the second thing is you're going to see once I like kind of stop doing things is it kind of distributes, it kind of settles. And I'll tell you what that rule is explicitly. You might be able to guess, but. So this has two rules. And remember, again, gravity doesn't exist here. All we have is a grid. And then we go up one frame from frame one to frame two. And then we have a different grid. Frame three, different grid, yada, yada, yada. And it's the combination of these playing at motion that makes it look like things are happening deliberately. Well, let's talk about what gravity is. How do we do that? Well, imagine we have a pixel that is illuminated. Again, illuminated, let me just do it like that. Um, illuminated means that there is sand there. Well, we know that this one should fall, okay? We have a pixel, it's up high, it should fall. But how do we really know it should fall? We need to actually think about that. Well, we know it should fall because it's not on the ground, okay? And we also know it should fall because there's nothing beneath it, okay? Think about this. If I had a tower of sand that went all the way up here, uh, this one would not fall because it's supported uh, underneath it. So really, we know something should fall if there's nothing underneath it. And then this one's kind of obvious, but if there is sand. So one, there has to be sand on a pixel. And number two, there has to be no sand below it. And then what's going to happen on the next frame if that is true? Well, the sand, it's not going to move to the right, but I'm just showing you the, the next kind of frame here. Uh, the pixel moves downwards. That's what gravity is. Now, remember, th this doesn't exist. There's no particles we're moving. So really what we're doing to get it from up here to down here is we are deleting this pixel. We're making it dead again and making the one underneath it alive. So we go from a situation like this where the top one's lit to a situation like this where the bottom one's lit, which will give the illusion of gravity. So under those conditions, we do certain updates. So let's start off with gravity, which is much easier than the next one. So because we want to do gravity, on every single frame, and I'm gonna put the spawner in here as well later, but for now, just kind of ignore that technicality. So we spawn a pixel, and then for every single frame, that's why I'm doing a simulation zone, it updates, it updates based on the previous state. In every single frame, it should fall. How do we know if it should fall? Well, remember, remember this pixel should fall if First of all, it exists if there is sand there. So I'm going to write in sand. This attribute basically tells us, is there sand or not? If it's equal to one, there's sand. If it's zero, there's not. And how do we check the one underneath it? Well, remember, our indexing goes up, 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 up for 19 pixels. And then it goes back here and then up, 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 up. Uh, what that tells me is if I'm looking at a pixel like this one, we know the one above it is basically the index plus one. It's If this is pixel 35, the one above it is 36. 
the one below it's 34. So we just add one and subtract one to the index, except of course at the floor and the ceiling where it like wraps back around, which is why we isolated them. So in other words, to check the one beneath it, I'm going to take the index of our pixel, of our face, I'm gonna subtract by one, and we wanna check at this index, what is sand equal to? Well, nice little node for this. We can evaluate at index. So this tells us, um, again, always face. Uh, this tells us at the index, minus one, the one beneath it, what is the sand equal to, okay? So again, how do we know if there's gravity? Well, there's going to be gravity if, first of all, the pixel is alive. So first of all, there is sand here. And second of all, the one beneath it, which is represented by this, uh, the one beneath it is dead, okay? So like one, one kind of very simple way you could think about this if you don't wanna get fancy, and maybe we don't actually, so we want to know that the one below it is equal to zero. And we want to know that the current pixel is equal to one. And maybe we could just like kind of do it as integers since we know it's either zero or one might be kind of easier to tell. Maybe I'll do it this way. You could do a fancy way with subtraction. So again, I want to know if first of all, the pixel exists or has sand, so it's equal to one, and then the one underneath it is equal to zero. Well, when both of these are true, so I'm gonna multiply. So when both of these are true, multiplication means both and both conditions have to be true. This and this and this addition means or, doesn't matter. Uh, when this and this are true, what do I wanna do? I wanna move the pixel down. Well, that involves two steps, remember. So again, this is basically saying, should I move a pixel down? If this is the case, so this is gonna be our selection, what I wanna do is I wanna take the sand at that pixel and set it to zero. What does that mean? Well, if we have a piece of sand here and it should fall, I need to get rid of it, that's step one, and then I need to add it below, below. Okay, so this step deletes it because it looks at the current index and sets sand to zero. And then the second part is we want to set sand to one for the pixel underneath it, which isn't obvious how to do, actually. Well, let's think about this. So again, we have a pixel here. We know there's nothing beneath it, so we know we want to delete it and add one beneath. But once we delete it, how do we know we're beneath this? Well, Let's think about it like this. If we had a pixel here and we then want to illuminate the one beneath it, we could look at it from the perspective of this pixel. What is the best way to explain this? Well, let's see. If we have a pixel over here and we want it to be subject to fake gravity and it goes down, well, we know this empty pixel over here should be illuminated if it is empty and it has sand above it. So it's almost the opposite, right? This should die, it should get rid of the sand because it's moving down if it exists and there's nothing beneath. And this should be populated if it is empty and the one above it is populated, okay? So it seems complicated, but it's uh, kind of the same thing. Well, to look above it, we're taking the index plus one. So I'm now in the reference frame of the other pixel. It's strange. I'm in the reference frame of the other pixel and I'm looking up one. So that's why I'm adding one to the index. And I wanna know, is the one above it populated? Is there sand there? Is this equal to one? And second of all, I wanna know if there's no sand here. Because if there's already sand there, then we have a tower. Well, we wanna know if this is equal to zero. So again, we're checking if the index above it is populated equal to one, and if itself doesn't exist equal to zero. And if both of those are true, then I want to, um, Set sand equal to one. I want to enable the one beneath it. Now, uh, you might be tempted, a lot of work there, you might be tempted to just put it in the selection, right? This is the case where we want to add sand. However, it's not gonna work. Why isn't it gonna work? Well, we have our pixel. We then delete it, because it needs to move downwards, but then, oh, if there are no pixels, how is it gonna do this? So 
we need to do both of these updates at the same time. Now, right now it's doing one and then the other. Let me demonstrate. So I am going to go to rendered view and I'm gonna go to pixel zero. So we have our pixel, okay? Now remember the first update we do is we say, okay, there's a pixel here, but nothing beneath it. So I got to delete this one, right? That's how it's going to update. Well, I do that, now it's gone. But now I want the pixel beneath it to populate by saying, oh yeah, there was one above there before, but it's gone, okay? So we can't do one after the other. In fact, what we have to do is we have to save this information from before. Okay, make sure this is set to face. And what I did here is I added a capture attribute. I'm saving the attribute before we do our deletion. And then this is gonna be the selection, okay? Make sure this is set to faces, everywhere faces. Okay, don't forget that. So now, well, we'll see it in a second, but in theory, now it should work and it doesn't work because we actually wanted that one, okay? Now, if I go back and forth, you can see it's actually falling. Let's kind of clarify why. This whole mess tells us whether or not we should delete a pixel due to gravity. And this whole mess tells us, should we add a pixel beneath it due to gravity? Well, first of all, we, cap we, captured, the we captured the information for whether or not we should add it later. So we save this, we delete the pixel, and then because we have the information from before, we add the pixel, okay? Now there's a bit of a technicality here. If you can see it, that's great. So I'm gonna play this and then, oh, can you see the issue? It does have gravity, but it kind of loops over because it doesn't know to stop at the floor. But good news is the gravity does work even if we have two pixels, they both fall. So, of course, the technicality here is that it doesn't really know it, that there is a floor. And again, remember, we have this set. So let's say we have a pixel here that is resting on the uh, floor pixels. We know that our gravity rule, this should only delete, we should only set sand equal to zero if, if uh, first of all, it is populated. So this pixel has sand. And if the one beneath it, the one beneath it doesn't have sand. Well, right now the floor doesn't have sand. Weird, okay? Uh, so it will fall through because it doesn't care about the floor. So what I'm saying is we need to either say, keep this rule, but also include the floor, pretend like the floor is also sand, or have it respect the floor. So it should either care about the floor or imagine that the floor is also sand, so it works. But I'm not gonna make the floor sand because then this whole row of now what is sand is going to fall and then go back to the ceiling, okay? So the way we have to do this is we have to say also care about the floor, okay? Complicated, <laughs> but let's do it. So what I wanna do is I wanna check, is there sand on the current pixel? Yes. But then we wanna check, is the bottom floor, is the uh, pixel uh, beneath it, is it not sand or is it a floor? Hmm. Well, let's see. This is where I started getting confused myself. So you can see why I'm confused now. So what I'm going to do is again, I'm gonna check the pixel beneath it. That hasn't changed. So the index minus one, what has changed is I don't care about sand, but now I wanna check if the pixel beneath it, if the pixel beneath it is floor. So I'm kind of doing a similar thing, but I'm checking if the pixel below index minus one is not sand, but if it is floor. In that case, if the pixel beneath it is floor, it should not delete. So maybe we can say we have everything before, but then we subtract this condition. What does that mean? Well, we had our rule before for whether or not it should delete a thing based on gravity. And by just that rule, in this case, it should delete the pixel because there's no sand ben beneath it. There's floor, but there's no sand. But now we're saying that, but also if you were going uh, to do that, 
and I might have the subtraction addition wrong, but we'll, we'll see this in a second. So regardless, now also check if the one beneath it is floor, and in that case, subtract that away. So for example, if this was true, <laughs> I know. If this was true, there's sand here and nothing below, it would fall, except subtract away, get rid of that if there's this. Okay? <laughs> I don't know if that made sense. And we'll see. Maybe it doesn't make sense. But let's find out. We have a pixel. I think it's not updating because uh some reason. Clearly, we messed up. See if I hide this. Oh, it's not simulating at all now. That is not necessarily an issue with our logic. I have found sometimes that if you hit undo in the middle of a middle of a simulation, it will just stop simulating. If anybody knows a fix to that, let me know. But first of all, I'm gonna get rid of this rule set as if we never had it. So we have gravity and it kind of loops over and over and over again. But now let me enable this and now it falls. And it kind of works. It's definitely doing something that seems to respect it a bit more. So let's see. Uh, we have a pixel. It falls, 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 falls. And then it sits. And then it does some weird stuff. Okay. So we're halfway there. You can see the pixels there. But now more sand is being added. So let's see. Our pixel knows to fall and to stay. However... Remember, gravity has two rules. If we have a pixel here, we know to move it down. We need to do two things. We need to delete this one and add in the bottom one. So we know the deleting part's fine, but the adding part hasn't been updated, okay? So for example, if we have a pixel over here that's above the floor, that's our scenario, we know uh, do not delete it. That's what the subtraction is. However, it does that, but now uh, the generating thing that populates the pixel underneath says, for this one, it says, oh, there's a pixel above it, and I was empty, therefore populate it. Okay, so now we have a pixel underneath here. We add one we didn't intend to make, and then that pixel falls. So it goes downwards, and that's why it's generating more pixels, I think. Okay, so we haven't updated our second rule. Well, let's think about how we would update our second rule. Well, what we want to say is if, uh, again, we're in reference to this pixel, if the one above it is populated and I'm not, populate it except, except when that pixel we're talking, hmm. what about this? Except when the one we're looking at is on the floor. How, how about that? Okay, so I'm saying if the one above it exists and I don't, where normally I would add a pixel, do that, except for when I'm on the floor. That may or may not work. Let's see. So I'm going to subtract away, very similar thing we did, if not the exact same, if I'm not the floor. So we want to evaluate at index. Well, I guess we can just like straight up put it in. So what I'm thinking right now, the reason I'm kind of stuttering here is I'm trying to think about how do we check if this pixel is on the floor? Well, clearly we just look at its floor attribute. And if this is the case, I want to subtract it away. So we have all of this, which says whether or not to apply it. But then if it is the floor, we're going to get rid of that possibility so that it doesn't populate. Remember, we're capturing attribute and all that. Let's see if that was the magic. So it falls. Thank God. <laughs> it falls and it doesn't do anything. Great. So I'm going to move it over here. Let's say there's two pixels. Uh, the reason that it kind of populates like this is because of our gravity rules. Um, we could fix it. So again, what's happening here actually is we have two pixels because there's two of them that are close. But then it applies our gravity rule on the uh, next frame. So it does that. It doesn't really matter. But the cool thing about that is you can see they actually now stack, so it's actually kind of worth seeing. But um, what was I saying? I was saying that no matter what our initial conditions are, it seems, even though it's weird, it seems to work. Now, additionally, I want you to remember, for our spawner, we could have equally said spawn pixels that are, you know, like that. 
and then it will not only fall, but it will stack correctly. Okay, that is rule one. <laughs> we did it. So what I'm trying to say here is that everything we just did is one of the only two rules we need for sand. And this is our gravity rule. Let's save that. That was a lot of work. Gravity should be kind of turquoise. Okay, so uh, we spawn our grid. Uh, we make the floor and the ceiling. We spawn our particles at the empty, and then we apply gravity. Great. Now we need another rule. Now, by the way, if I did this correctly, it should scale. So if I make this a 50 by 50 grid, and let me kind of bring down the radius of the uh, particles we want. If I make this a 50 by 50 grid, still works. Okay, it will take longer to fall because again, it's doing discrete steps at the same kind of frame rate. But my point is, no matter how dense, dense we make this grid, even though it takes a while, it will fall. Now, by the way, I want to mention that um, originally we had a 20, which means it falls at this speed. If you triple it to 60, where now it's falling three times slower, uh, the way to negate that is you triple the frame rate. That's kind of the thing with cellular automata. So if you want kind of the same simulation at a higher resolution, that is how you would do it. But let's do, now that we have that, I'm going to upgrade to 40 by 40, if not 50 by 50, so that we can actually start implementing our second rule. Okay, so clearly it falls, but it just kind of does that, right? It doesn't distribute in any way. And that becomes even more evident. So now I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to take our spawner and I'm going to move it inside of here. So let's predict what would happen there if I move my spawner. Well, now... Just with that little thing, we're getting something much nicer. We can actually continue, and I'll kind of restart here because we don't have that much space. In fact, let me even reduce the number of pixels it looks at. It's going to spawn just like it was, but, but it's inside the simulation zone, so it's doing it on every single frame, and then gravity is applied, and that's great. So now we can spawn dynamically, but this makes it even more evident uh, that nothing is distributing. So let's think about how distribution should work. Well, here's what we don't want. It's building a stack. We should have some of these pixels falling to the right, some of them falling to the left, but not all of them. Some of them should stay still. So we have three possibilities. A pixel will either go to the left or right or stay still. Right now they're all staying still, which is why we get a tower. Okay, so we know we want pixels to go left or right. That's useful, but which pixels, right? Imagine, imagine if you will, that we had an initial condition where we have a pixel right here that is subject to gravity. So it's deleting itself, updating the one beneath, deleting itself. Should this pixel be moving to the right or the left? No, it's just falling. Unless there's wind, it should not be going to the right or the left. But when should it be doing that? Well clearly somewhere around here where it hits the floor, okay? So let's say the pixel's now down here on the floor. Can it now stay still, move right or left? Yeah, because it's on the ground. But then, if that was the case, what if I had pixels above it? Well, those ones aren't touching the ground, so they'll just stay still, and then this pile will accumulate. Now, you could argue that if this pixel slides over to the side, then this tower has to fall and it has to distribute, and you could do that. But now this also has a problem, so why not that? This has a problem because if I have pixels to the left and the right, okay, and then I have this penis-shaped tower here, we want this one to move left or right so the stack can fall down, but it can't overlap this, okay? So clearly this left and right rule is a bit more complicated. Let me tell you what the rule is. The rule is, imagine you have a stack. If you have a pixel, let's say this one, and it exists, right? There is sand there. 
and if the one beneath it has sand. In other words, if um, it's stable, if it's standing on something, only then will you go to the right or the left. The beauty of this is it will happen to whatever pixel is currently on the top of the stack, kind of, because of order of operations. And then this one kind of shifts over and makes a stack here. And then we apply the rule again here. If this exists and the one beneath it is supporting it, then you can move to the right, left, or whatever. Okay? Now there is one technicality. There isn't one technicality. So let's say we have a pixel here. It's supported and it wants to go left. Well, it can't go left because one already exists. So in other words, here is how you do it. If a pixel, okay? If a pixel one exists, two is supported, in other words, the one beneath it exists, and three doesn't have pixels to the right or left, kind of. So if I wanna go to the right, but there is a pixel blocking it. So if there's also not a pixel here, then you can go to the right and conversely, if there is not a pixel there, then you can go left. So there's three things going on. One, one, pixel needs to exist. Two, pixel needs to be supported. The one underneath it exists. And three, it has room to move. Under that condition, it should move to the right or the left. And we are going to do that randomly. So I can choose randomly if it should go left or right or stay in the middle. Okay. <sighs> Now that we've set it, it should be easier to, to implement. So let's assume that we have a uh, pixel. So we have the floor. We have a pixel here on the floor, and we have one here. Let's say we're evaluating this one. So first of all, we want to see, does it have sand? Well, easy enough. Look at the attribute. Does it have sand? Next, I want to see if the one beneath it has sand. So first of all, if this has sand, then this is uh, equal to 1. Let's do integer so we don't have to look at this epsilon. So if sand exists and the one beneath it, so how do we do the one beneath? That is index minus, because we're looking down, minus one. If at that index we evaluate, so at that index, if sand, so remember, always faces, so at the one beneath it, if sand also exists, so it's equal to 1. So to get both of these, remember, we multiply to say we want both of them. So if sand exists and the one below it exists, so now we know it should kind of go left and right. But let's say specifically it wants to go right. And the one to the right of it does not exist. Okay, so how do we do that? So remember, we're not adding or subtracting 1. Right? So if we add or subtract one, we're looking at the one above and below. Remember, to look left and right, what did we say? We said if we have, let's simplify, a 20 by 20, which really is a 19 by 19 grid. Remember, we had that thing where this was the 0th pixel, 1938. In other words, if you're looking at 19, you subtract by 19 to look here, you add 19 to look there. So if we take our point resolution and subtract one, which is our face resolution, okay? So how many uh, pixels are there in a column in a row? And we add or subtract by that. So plus or minus one is up and down. Plus or minus this value is left and right, okay? So in other words, what I'm saying is if I look at the index, but this time I'm going to... Let's do right first. So I'm going to add 19. So remember, uh, this is on the floor. So if the one to the right, so that's the index plus 19, so 20 minus 1. If that one has a sand value, so we're evaluating at that index, if that one has a sand value equal to 0, it's available. There's nothing there. So if it exists, if it's supported, if there's room on the right, so I'm going to multiply all of these, so all of these conditions uh, need to be true. If all of them are true, then, only then, uh, do we need to move it to the right? But that's even more confusing, because remember, gravity meant we had a pixel here. We want it to fall, so we delete it. We implement it. 
Same thing happens when we go right. So if all those conditions are true, what is it that we actually want done? We want to delete it, okay? And then based on another set of conditions, then we spawn it, which will make it look like it's going to the right. So in other words, we have all our gravity. So gravity happens. We can have this happen in two steps. So we have our particles. They move because of gravity. And then we can say that sand, remember, on faces, sand is equal to zero. I delete a pixel if all these conditions are true. And we might need to think a bit harder. We might need to think a bit harder. Is this also going to like care about the floor? I don't know. For now, we're going to ignore it and see what happens. So that's step one. Step two is we need to spawn the one to the right of it. So sand is equal to one. So this pixel is now gone. And remember, if a pixel is gone, then we kind of can't get anything out of it. So I'm going to store information beforehand. Remember, this is equal to face. So in other words, we had this situation where we had a pixel here. It exists. It's supported. There's room to the right. Therefore, it deletes. But before it deletes, I want to know, I want to know, can I populate this one? Can I populate this one? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> How do we know if it should be populated? Let's think about that. Okay, so I thought about it. Okay, so we can make some crazy complicated rules or we can just think. So again, we know that this pixel wants to be deleted, but before that happens, we need to know how to spawn this one. Well, if we look at the reference from this pixel, right, which is actually the one to the right in this sense, we know we want to populate it if, if the one to the left of it, the one that we're going to delete, is going to be deleted because of that purpose. So in other words, if we have this pixel that wants to move right, then delete it. But before that happens, populate that pixel to the right. If this pixel had the intent of doing that, what the frick did I just say? <laughs> um, okay, so let, let, let's kind of simplify here. So I'm going to take the index. This time I'm looking left, so I'm not gonna add by 19 or 20 minus whatever. 20 minus one in this case, but I'm going to uh, subtract. So not add, but I'm going to subtract. So I'm going to look left. So if at this index, all kinds of things are true. So remember for this to exist or for it to want to be deleted for that purpose, first of all, if, uh, sorry, if at that index, again, make sure it's face. If first of all, what do I want? If first of all, it exists, okay? So again, if the pixel to the left exists, okay? Two, if that pixel to the left is supported by a pixel under it, okay? Seems complicated, but it's not really. So, so first of all, uh, we want to see if it exists, if this is equal to one. Next, I want to see if the pixel to the left and down one exists, okay? So we take this and then we subtract that by one. So first of all, we're looking to the left by subtracting by 19 in this case. Then we're looking one downwards. So evaluate at that index. If the sand there also exists, okay? And then remember, so again, this pixel will delete because it wants to move to the right if the conditions are one, uh, it exists, two, it's supported, and three, this is empty, okay? And then three, if this pixel is empty, which that one's actually pretty uh, simple because we are in reference to this pixel. So again, we're looking at all these attributes, but really we are from this perspective. So we're looking to the left from the perspective of this guy and left and down from the perspective of this guy. So if this pixel itself is also not activated, in other words, there is room to go right under all of those conditions. So it's almost like we did the same thing here, but from a different perspective. If all of these conditions are true, then remember, we're first of all deleting that pixel. So I want to make sure I capture it before that happens. And then I'm going to, I'll do it again, put that selection here, then move to the right. Is it possible that I made a mistake? Of course but we will see. So clearly, 
clearly uh, we have made a mistake. But here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that pixels are falling. Oh, wait. Did I speak too soon? I spoke too soon. Let us update this. So clearly there's still an issue, but let's see. So we have this. Okay, okay. So it's kind of, it clearly wants to go to the right. And it kind of makes an interesting pattern here. So it kind of works, but first of all, let's add stability before we fix this. So first of all, we're spawning too many pixels to see what's going on. So I'm just going to divide that by two. So now we have something simpler. So pixels are falling. Now, by the way, why are they making this zigzag shape? They're making this zigzag shape because we had two pixels on top of each other and there was one empty. So it actually did that rule we were just talking about. So that's why it's making a zigzag. But either way, you can see they are now actually distributing to the right. So what's the issue? Well, the first issue is none of them are going to the left, of course. But the second issue is it's going to the right every single time. It should only go a third of the time, okay? So all I need to do now is I need to say, keep the same rule, but now I wanna say, if you satisfy a one third chance, then do this, okay? So in other words, let's clean this up. So this was our delete the supported pixel condition. This was our generate the pixel to the right condition. So what I want to say is if all these conditions are true, so we're deleting the pixel, we know the scenario. Is my drawing still here? It's not. Okay. Let me just make it one more time. We have the floor, a supporting pixel, an existent pixel. So we want to delete this one because it exists, because it's supported, and because there's something to the right. Only do that if it also passes through. It's going to multiply A. Let's do a random value. It's probably the cleanest way to do that. So it's going to make a random number between 0 and 1. You could also make it integers, but I think this is clean. So we say if this is less than, less than a third. So this pixel, which is supported, has things to the right, is also of a random number. So I'm just going to put this here. Let's say it's a random number 0.21, which is less than a third. So it also satisfies that condition, then move to the right, fine. But then we're also saying, uh, if it's only happening a third of the time, how can we be sure that this one should also be existing, right? Because we know that the one to the left exists, is supported, but how do we know if it passed that one third condition? Well, let's think about it. All we need to do is remember everything we were doing here is from the perspective of this pixel, but we're checking the one to the left. Well, all we need to do is we need to check that random value that it got. So we needed to see the random value. We needed to see if that random value was indeed less than a third. But remember, I don't want to just check if this pixel, this pixel here is less than a third. No, I want to check if the one to the left ended up moving. So I want to see if the index subtracted yeah, subtracted that 19 minus one thing, like we look one column to the left, okay? So if at that index, so if at the pixel to the left, it passed that one third check, sorry, there's a lot of hap stuff happening in the hallway, uh, but if it also does that, then generate the uh, pixel. You could argue that that makes sense. We'll see time will tell. So now you're actually also going to see that um, it doesn't seem, sorry about the noise, uh, it seemed, well, I know you don't hear it, it's distracting me, uh, but now it actually generates in a single file, which is interesting, but that seems to have done it. So yeah, the interesting thing is, let's, let's give ourselves more frames. Uh, the interesting thing is, is it works, but more than that, it um, seems to fall in a single file, which I don't know if I would have expected, even though I made this before. Uh, let's play this at a higher uh, frame rate, which is still gonna give the exact same results, just faster. I just wanna see what this distribution ends up looking like. Okay, so what you are going to see is it kind of, kind of, kind of 
creates this right side of a bell curve. That's actually good news. That's what we would expect. But what I was about to say is we can also move these odds, you know? So let's say I made it like less than 0.45, which is a higher probability of happening. Make sure to do that here and here. If I was to do that instead, you're going to see not only does it bring back the zipper, but now our bell curve is much smoother instead of being like a tall peak. So that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to say that, so again, this should be a third, that should be a third in theory. We'll need to rethink it in a second, but okay. So given all of that, <laughs> pixels flow to the right. So this rule was more complicated than gravity. So take all of that. Lucky thing is we can just control G and you're going to see, by the way, that there's this second input that goes in here, but that is because we care about the resolution of our grid, because that's how we know if we're looking left or right. So this one is going to be move right. And I know what you're thinking. We have to do this again <laughs> for move left. We don't. In fact, we barely need to change it. So we have move right. And now, and now I'm going to do move left. We're going to use the exact same thing to know the uh, column number and all this. So this one I'm going to call. So I hit that. Um, let me do it again. I hit this number two to make these not linked anymore so they can be edited independently. So I'm just going to update all these names. Um, move left, we're going to go into here. Basically the exact same thing, but now instead of looking right, we're going to look left. All we need to do is whenever we get this input, so we're subtracting by this to look left, now just add it to look right. Okay, don't think about it too hard. Now we follow this one. Instead of adding, we subtract. And I believe that is all we need to do, except uh, right now the issue is it's kind of saying if you know the random number is less than a third, go left and right. <laughs> like It's actually going to overwrite the decision. Like left is then going to become right or whatever order of operations. So I want to make sure these uh, statistics are different. So instead of less than a third, let's say greater than two thirds. So one third chance it goes to the left, one third chance it stays in the middle, one third chance it goes to the right, but it's using the same random number. That's important. So remember, greater than two thirds. I believe that should be everything we need. So even though one comes after the other, they should work in harmony, potentially. If not, you could do them as a single step, but whatever. We'll see if that's necessary. So some of them go right, some of them go left. We're going to see if this is biased to go a certain way. And the thing is, you're going to need to let this run for quite a while to actually even tell that. But luckily for us, we got that. I'm just going to up the resolution. So now we have more resolution, and I'm going to up the frame rate. So the beauty of this is it just goes so fast. I'm just going to play this. And we're going to see what kind of distribution it ends up making. So we're going to do this. And then I'm going to put the empty inside of here so it doesn't generate anymore. Huh. Looks like we need more frames. So here I'm just testing our probability distribution. If you go to the uh, Boston Science Museum, you'll see something called a uh, Galton board. And that's basically this idea of using randomness to make a binomial distribution. Yep. That is what we would expect. It's a little, a little lopsided, but you can tell it's trying to make this bell curve. That's actually good news, although it kind of is making a triangle. But either way, it's going left and right. That is good news. Again, I can always switch the probabilities to say 50% chance it goes left, 50% chance it goes right, and you think, oh, isn't that a uh, issue? Well, it definitely will. Oh, wait. Make sure I forgot to do it everywhere. So this is greater, or sorry, less than 0.5. This is also less than 0.5. Going to the other one, greater than 0.5, greater than 0.5. Okay. So yes, these odds can be shifted so they're not actually like, you know, accurate of reality. But overall, we're just going to kind of change the speed at which they kind of settle. 
And if anything, this is making much more of a uh, smooth bell curve. Really a triangle. But you're not going to notice because I can just keep adding sand and it will uh, keep doing this. So I guess what I'm saying is that should be like close to accurate. But if I want it to be 100% accurate, it shouldn't move right and then move left. No, I think this should work, actually. I don't know. If you wanted to be sure, make sure to put a capture attribute here so both of these are done uh, similarly. But, but uh, we can actually go further than this. And this is why simulation nodes are so dope. Remember, everything we've done here, this left and right decision, is actually based on a single random value. Yes, we have more nodes for it, but the seed is zero here and the seed is zero here, so they're actually the same. What I can do is this is going to be a little, a little cool. I can take the scene time node and connect this to the seed of uh, both of these. Okay. So now, yes, the random number is changing, but they're changing identically. Okay. So I'm going to do that here. Make sure to also do that at the other thing so they're all using the same random numbers. Otherwise, you're going to get some weird results, I'm sure. Now they're all using the same number, but that number is updating. Okay. And what that will mean is that the sand, look at that. That is a bell curve it will make a smoother bell curve. And I guess that is actually what is separating it from reality from before. Like the reason it didn't make that perfect bell curve is we assumed there was this perfect like eye in the sky randomness that never changed. Whereas, you know, the physical conditions are always changing and that's what's gonna make that nice, nice bell curve. Okay, so we have our sand simulator. I don't really understand why when you go faster it does this but it's nice and smooth. And if we let it settle, it should. We do kind of have the issue of outflow, I believe, because like we don't know what to do with the pixels on the edge, but that's fine. And if we wanted to, uh, we could take the spawner and reduce the, um, the number of pixels made, and this will just have it kind of gather more slowly. Um, so that looks good. I think the reason it kind of looks a bit fluid-like, so I'm just going to do one more modification, is I'm going to go back to that one-third odds. Now that we know that we are, um, now that we know that we are like switching random seeds every single time. I don't know in theory if that will make a difference. So now this is two-thirds because we're greater than, but we can see if this distributes a bit slower. So what I'm seeing is it, <laughs> it does not like that, is what I'm learning from this. And let me just see if that was a mistake on our part. So greater than two thirds, greater than two thirds. Okay. And did I use the same random number each time? I did. And then less than a third, less than, ah, less than 1.3. That should probably be the issue. Okay, so now it will accumulate, but I think it will be less like liquid-like and take more time. By the way, if you put your empty over here, it's gonna spawn from the sky, which is great actually, you know, why not? This is actually a great way to make a uh, hourglass simulation. And you're asking, can I make an hourglass simulation? Yeah. So we made a special condition for the floor which you can think of as an obstacle. You can also have an obstacle like this. You can make a hill. So you can have this actually become quite more complicated. Okay? So it has kind of the physics of sand. Okay, let me do one more thing. You know, this is actually better than the result I made myself earlier. That's why I'm getting excited. So I'm just gonna make the odds even smaller. Let's say it only has a 10% chance. Now, what do these percent chances represent? They kind of represent the stickiness of the sand or kind of like how resistant it is to motion because it has less of a chance of distributing. So it's kind of like how much can the sand stick to each other? So if I do this, now it will kind of have a different quality where it kind of takes a, uh, hmm. 
I can't say that I like that. I'm sorry. Can't say that I like it. So I'm just going to go back to the previous settings. But as I do that, let me talk about something that I find interesting. So that is already great. And you can see that it was um, going at quite a uh, fast speed. Because at the end of the day, we're just calculating 40,000 faces, most of which don't have updates. I don't know if it checks for every single one to have an update. I guess it would. So what we can do is we can actually take a dynamic sampling. Maybe that's a Patreon tutorial. Again, if you want the good file that I kind of work through, that's going to be on Patreon. And if you wanted to get crazy, every sand could have its own probability. So they all have like different shapes if you wanted to get crazy. Uh, but it simulates so fast that you could get like full resolution. But the reason it looks so smooth is because of our, you know, fake physics. But also the reason it looks so smooth is because the resolution is very high. So if I reduce this now, so our pixels look bigger, um, it will kind of give it more of that nice pixelated look if that's what you wanted uh, in the first place. Okay. And you can get uh, ridiculous with that. So that that's if you wanted more of the pixel-like look, that's uh, what you get. But what I wanted to show you is you could get crazy with the resolution, and it's still not just in like real time, but it's simulating like really quickly. So now it like really looks like sand. And if you wanted to, you could add forces like wind. I don't know what else you, you could do anything as long as you can define it in terms of cellular automata. But I think what I like is I like uh, 60 frames per second at 200 is a good life for me. That feels like a nice speed and a nice resolution. So uh, what I wanted to say is a final thing to kind of make this look less like water is we need to see every single sand grain. Okay. How do we do that? Well, to see every single sand grain, what I can do is I can actually just make a random attribute. Remember, this is on faces. Everything is on faces. I'm going to call it random. It's going to be a random number, not between 0 and 1, but 0.5 and 1. What this is for is I'm going to color the sand. I'm making this 0.5 so none of the sand is black. It's going to be between mid-color and bright. Okay, you'll see what I'm doing in a second. But now... By the way, this is all a material effect at the end of the day. So I could totally just like, I could totally just like color ramp and change the color of the sand. Uh, but I wanted to get a bit more granular. Ha ha ha. Um, this will generate a, a random distribution from 0.5 to 1 per pixel. And yes, it's everywhere, but we're going to clamp it to the sand. Um, so. What I want to do is I want to take these and pick uh, two colors. So maybe one of them is going to be kind of like a yellowish sandy color. The other one's going to be more orange but darker. So we get kind of something like this. And then we are going to use this as a factor. I guess both of these should be factors, but it's just going to take the X component, which is all the same. Um, okay. So we, oh, that actually looks really nice. I'm almost regretting my decision. So maybe we can do something like this and plug in something like that so we kind of get the best of both worlds. I mean, now I'm, I'm kind of questioning, like, what will look cool? Uh, but you can see this idea of the sand... Um, doing the thing and we could even get more complicated where like on updates it can change the seed locally but i think this looks good because it makes the sand that is settled look like it's not um you know what i mean the 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 other possibility by the way is i could update this uh, random number so i could go to four dimensional and have this like itself update over time and uh, the way I would do that is um, I could take something like the uh, frame number and round on every 10 frames. So I'm going to take the ceiling of hash frame divided by 10. So it's on every 10 frames, it will round to the nearest integer. And what that will look like 
is it's moving like this, fine. But we could actually get even more complicated where we can say the sand that has settled on the bottom should probably update less than the thing on the top. Maybe. Let's try it. So I'm going to do a math node. I'm going to take hash frame divided by 10 as a base, but then, then I can also look at the, what do I want? I want the um, generated coordinates. And specifically, I want the uh, Y coordinate, which will tell us how tall we are. And then, I can uh, take this and multiply it by something like this. So we'll kind of get a gradient where I can take this, take a ceiling function, take the W, and let's see what this looks like. Kind of weird, kind of weird. But you can see how it's updating more at the top. What does that look like in practice? Kind of a weird effect. I don't like how it's like slowly transitioning. If you wanted to fix that, what I do is you could store this as an attribute. In fact, I will. I will store it as an attribute. Um, you could do it anywhere. I'm just going to do it on faces. Uh, I'm going to store res. There are more efficient ways to do this. There really are. But I'm going to store the resolution on every single one. Why am I doing that? The reason I'm doing that is now I can take this Y coordinate. Now we're getting real fancy, and I can snap it, snap it to this attribute, which actually knows the resolution. Okay, so we're going to get a bit, a bit complicated here. Warning. I'm going to take one divided by this. Is that what I want? What, what, let me tell you what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is I want this, like, Y thing but it's not continuous so you can see here i've like made it into bands and the question is how many bands do i want i think it's one over the resolution but i'm not sure is this what i called it that i just call it res i did why is that not saving over I see. So clearly it's not storing the resolution for some reason. So we have the grid. I don't know if this should matter, but let me get it a bit cleaner. So it should store the face, call it res everywhere, but it doesn't like that because maybe it gets overwritten. I'm really trying. I, I know it might be obvious. I just don't see it at the moment. So I'm just going to try like some basic stuff of like moving it around. See if that does anything. That seemed to work. I need to think about why, uh, but I will not. Uh, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to snap it. And now you can't tell unless I zoom in. I don't know if YouTube captures that, but now it's like st st striated. Either way, you can see it updates more on the top. I mean, that's still looking whack. Still looking whack, but let's see what that looks like. I don't know. I really do not know how I feel about that, to be honest. Um, okay. I'll secede. I do not like that. I do not like that. So I'm going to go back to hash frame divided by 25. If anybody can figure out how to make it look cooler, you know, let me know. But for now, I'm just going to, you know, kind of vibe with it. If not, not change it at all. I don't know. Uh, but either way, for optimization, I'm going to get rid of this now since we're not using it. Uh, there's other optimizations you can do. Like, like I said, you can do adaptive grids where instead of sampling at every pixel, I could say... We're not using any of these pixels up here. Treat them as one. I don't know, something like that. I don't know if that's even necessary. But, um, okay, so the point of this was to kind of get the look for it. So let's try to do that. 
So I'm just gonna make some sand, some here, some there. Okay. And now I just wanna find what the look is that kind of looks the best to me. So we could do something like that. We can also add a post-processing effects. Um, and if you wanted to get crazy, I know, I know. If you wanted to get crazy, what you can do is you can kind of blend these together, I believe, by blurring. So if you wanted kind of like a cleaner look, you can do something like that. I, I guess I don't know why you would want to, but you could. And even a step further is you can take the sand attribute, which says where is there going to be sand, and then replace this with a blurred out version to kind of give it a smoother uh, quality. Okay? So before, after... I don't like that because we put in all this work anyways. But I could argue that I do like the uh, smoothing of the randomness, even if it's just a little. Just a little. Makes it feel like it uh, looks nice. And other than that, you could get real crazy with like guessing velocity by looking at multiple grids or something like that. I don't know if I wanna. I don't think I do wanna. I'm also curious what happens. Will it naturally smooth out forever? I see. Final thing. <laughs> Final thing. If you wanted to change kind of the behavior of this, right now we're using the uh, frame thing. So remember, we can just get rid of it. What will getting rid of it do? It will keep it at a constant seed, and I'll show you what I'm getting at in a moment. So now we have a constant seed, which will make it behave actually quite more differently. So now it actually maintains its shape a bit more, which is interesting. So maybe this is something you want to control. But you see, like, it stabilizes. So maybe what you want to do, actually, is kind of get the best of both worlds. You, you yes, yes, use the frame number. But instead, maybe you have it update only once per second. So instead of the frame number, we look at the second number. So it is going to, let's see, it is going to get the best of both worlds. So let's see, I'm going to make some sand and let's see. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And then if you wanted to get fancy, you could have these updates happen differently in different sections. Ooh. That nice, that nice. I'm just gonna have it happen a bit more frequently, a bit more frequently. I am going to have it happen instead of uh, once per frame per second, I'm gonna have it happen um, twice per second. Or maybe you could go somewhere in between. It should just round this to an integer anyhow, so I don't really care. If I multiply an integer by something like that, it should on average make it happen 50% faster. I guess we'll be able to tell in a second. So I'm gonna do something like that. Yeah, it does seem to be updating a bit faster. Look at that. So if you wanted to get crazy, you could store other attributes that kind of pass on. But at that point, why even use cellular automata? So Kind of the point of this tutorial was you can get really complex behavior from only two rules, kind of like an update gravity rule and also a um, distribution rule. And you could get crazy. Maybe you could have a, a deletion. Okay, I got to do it now. I'm going to make a deletion thing. How long have we been going, by the way? Tell me we've been recording. Whew. This is a long end. Um, okay. Well, if we're going this long, let's go long. I also wanted to add a uh, deletion, uh, which is actually going to be pretty similar to the spawner. So the spawner can become deleter. 
And it's basically going to say, instead of um, creating particles in the vicinity of the thing, I'm going to say delete particles, which literally is as easy as saying disable the sand and look at the second empty. Okay, so we generate nice sand here. Just going to make some towers. Okay, let's say we're happy with that. Now we pass our... Oh, I did it again. Do not hit undo during simulation nodes. There might be a fix for it, but I don't know what it is. So I'm going to simulate some sand. And then I'm going to uh, delete the sand. Okay, so we get some sand here accumulating. Let me get some in a bunch of areas. And then I take this empty. Yeah. And if we wanted to make it look visually more interesting, I can have it have a larger radius. So it like really deletes some, um, a lot of sand. So let's see, something like that. And I could also do something where the scale of the empty affects how many uh, things it makes. So let's see. That's great. Okay, final thing, final thing. And what is that final thing is uh, at the beginning of this video, you saw a demo for the sand. And that demo is going to be exactly what I'm playing right now. So I just got to record this for the uh, beginning of the uh, tutorial. So I'm going to make some uh, sand here. And then I'm going to delete sand. Then I'm going to spawn some more. I guess you could move it like this. That's interesting. And the physics just work because it's only based on two very simple rules. That's great. Okay. One more thing. <laughs> that last thing is going to be a high resolution just because we can and it updates super quick. And by super quick, I mean we need 120 frames per second. And let's make that a little less intense. It d the complexity does go up as a quadratic, if you understand what that means. Something like that. Our deleter. Wow, that's great. I think next is making like an hourglass out of this is probably the way. So let me just center this. This file is going to be available on Patreon. I would highly recommend getting it because not only does it keep this channel afloat financially or lets me uh, invest the time I want into instead of like doing other VFX work, um, you get stuff like this. And I'm going to, like you've been noticing, I'm trying to make higher quality tutorials that are of value instead of like the dumb shit where it's like, oh, I made bah, 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 in three days, I learned Blender. Bah, bah, bah. Bah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to do something that I feel like is uh, more valuable than that. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's it for me. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully I was recording. Patreon, do it.